What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we cleared the inventor's house, and in this episode, we are going to tackle the decorator's house. So, without further ado, let's hop into it. Um, I'm, to be honest, I'm just continuing this after the previous episode because I hadn't played in a few days, and man, did I miss this game and the puzzles in it, and... I just want to do some more. It's a little bit later than I would like, and I'm probably going to get a little bit less sleep than I should, but... But Leighton calls. So, <laughs> here we are. The decorator's house. Puzzle number 124. Do give this puzzle a go. Oh, we will. Missing number. 70 picarats. Okay. The number below... The numbers below all follow a certain rule. What's the missing number? Okay. 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, blank. 1, 2, 1, 3. Well, whatever pattern there is, certainly ain't jumping out right now. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, they all follow a certain pattern. And it's probably not some complex arithmetic, right? I kind of learned that from the previous dice puzzle. Uh, it's probably not something that's, you know, that, that involved. It's probably noticing a particular element. You could split it up. There are ten numbers, right? So if you split it up into, like, either pairs, I guess? Or maybe sets of five? You can maybe find something? It's only involving one, two, and three for now. There's nothing to say it couldn't be a different number, right? If we go to input answer, yeah, they just want a number. Um, but there's nothing to say it couldn't be a four, a zero, or, or whatever. And I wouldn't put it past Layton to do that. It's that, it's that fifth slot with the second one in a row that I feel like is uh, throwing me for a little bit of a loop. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about this one. <laughs> I'm gonna have to think about this one. Let's see here. I don't know, guys. <laughs> I've been thinking about this for, uh, for quite some time now, actually. And... I don't know. Um, things I've tried are looking at the difference between each number, um, looking at the sum of numbers, so it's like the total up until that point. If you look at the totals, right, so it'll go 1, 3, 6, 7, 8, and then x, and then x plus 9, x plus 11, x plus 12, x plus 15, and I don't see much in there. If you look at the differences between the numbers, you'll get 1, 1, 2, 0, x, x, 1, 1, 2. Um, which which could be interesting, I guess. It, if you wanted to keep it 100% symmetrical, um, x would have to be 0, meaning the, the question mark would actually be an, a 1. But I don't think that's very reliable. <laughs> um, or not, not even symmetrical, but just kind of like a pattern, I guess. Uh, the difference between the question mark and the ones on both sides of it would need to be 0, so that would make the question mark 1. But I don't, I don't think that's going to be the rule that they're talking about. I've tried, you know, kind of splitting it up into sets of two, so like either 12, 31, and then one something, something one, 20, or then, uh, what's it called, uh, 12, you know, 13, etc. Or like with some sort of overlapping, so it's like 12, and then 23, and then 31, and then 1x, and then x1, and then 12, 21, 13, and I'm not really seeing much there. I was trying to think maybe if you turn if you just kind of think about things a little bit more abstractly and think about oh in the first five you know those ones twos and threes are in a specific spot and in the last five what like what exchanges would you have to make between the two numbers um, so for example moving the, th the third well the three with the fifth one and then switching the second slot with the with the third slot in order to get that arrangement on the right but that would just not change the one which would make the question mark a one 
but I also don't think that's what they're going for. So I'm not 100% sure. I've, you know, tried thinking in terms of, oh, if the first slot is number one, the second is number two, the third is number three, is there an operation you can do to that slot number to get the number that actually enters that slot? And I was trying to think even in terms of just like, like mod four, mod five, or, or whatever it may be, and couldn't come up with much. I was also thinking, does it have to do something with the numbers themselves? So like the number of like corners or something, you know, silly like that. And I don't really, don't really see much. Um, yeah, or even like number of times you have to, well, no, that, that, that would change based on how you write certain numbers. So yeah, I'm, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet. And I think I'm getting close to actually, you know, let's, let's go with a hint. Um, at this point, it, the way they say it sounds like it's each number follows a certain rule. It must mean there's some sort of relationship between each number and the numbers around it or to the num to some other number right to what slot it's been assigned but i've gone through some of the more i guess accessible ones and haven't really found much so i i do think it is time for a hint let's unlock one as mentioned earlier, the numbers are lined up according to some rule or idea. Continuing the string out to the left, the number that would go in front of the first number is zero. The one that comes after the final three is one. So they give us some more to work with. Can I draw? Oh, I can. So it would be a zero and a one. So they give us a little bit more data to work with. Does that help? I'm sure it does. But I'm not really seeing how yet. Um, hmm. It's not like it's a palindrome or anything like that. Let's think on this for a bit. I guess what's interesting is that they're able to say, oh, the number that would come before would be zero and the number that comes after would be one. Why does that matter? It rules out the idea of the rule being related to the slot number, right? Because now if the number coming before the, the very first one they originally show would be zero, that would be the new slot one in this order. And as a result, um, that would also then be a one if the rule were based off of that slot number. So it rules out that idea. It has to be a relationship between the numbers themselves. So I guess that's, that's some progress. So how do we take those other numbers and figure it out? So some other, I guess, strategies that I'm trying to think of, um, similar to the dice, for each individual number, I want to look at what comes before and after it, right? So, for example, if I look at the two, the very first two, it has a one before it to the left and a three to the right of it. However, the two later on has a one before it and a one after it. So, there must be something other than, I guess, the, the num those numbers themselves that changes that one on the right to being a three. So if there is some sort of rule or these numbers are influencing each other, there's got to be some, maybe it extends beyond, you know, um, even just a set of two or three, right? Looking at the very first number one, um, to the left of that is a zero and to the right of it is a two. However, the next one we encounter has a three to the left and a one to the right. And then we see a 1 later on, on the far right, that has a 2 before it and a 3 after it. So, so what's going on <laughs> that leads to, um, what else could be contributing to it that leads to, um, you know, those numbers being so drastically different? I guess something else that first hint tells us is that whatever rule there is, 
it can go both left and right, right? So given the first few numbers, we can determine there's a zero to the left. And given the last few numbers on the right, we can determine that there's a one that comes after. So, so whatever rule there is, it has to be bi-directional, right? In that it applies to the left or to the right. Or it's completely independent of all the numbers around it. Because if you needed, you know, both numbers to the left of a, of a number in order to get what comes to the right, um, we would only be able to get the one, right? We wouldn't be able to get the zero on the left. Unless that's the only combination of numbers that would give rise to two being the second number. But um, we don't know that 100%. So, I admittedly don't think I'm going to get that much further without another hint. Like I said, I'm just not, not seeing it. And I hope I don't come out of this feeling like I wasted a good amount of time. If you were to break up the string of numbers, the first group is 1000 or 1231. Does this group make you think of anything, anything at all? No, <laughs> it doesn't, because I've thought about this before. Um, 12, 31, and then again, this number would be zero. And this would be one. I mean, I've been thinking in terms of sets of two, three, four, it's 1231. Does this make you think of anything at all? That's what they said, right? No, I don't want to hit, unlock it yet. Does this group make you think of anything? Anything at all? Do they want me to think about time? Maybe like a clock? And then we'd have another set of four. But then... You know, what's this at the end here, right? This 13. And why is there still a 0 and a 1? Twelve thirty one is supposed to ring a bell? Why would, why would the zero come to the left and a one come to the right? So the twelve thirty one needs to be, I don't know, somewhat recognizable. It's got to ring some sort of bell. And using that set of four, I've got to be able to get what comes to the left of it, which would be zero, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's because I'm really tired and it's getting really late now, but whatever I'm supposed to see is not, not apparent. Yeah, I'm going to go for a third hint. If you need another hint, look no further than your closest calendar should find numbers lined up in a similar fashion within its pages. Numbers lined up within a with a similar fashion within its pages. Really? That's the rule? It's the, their calendar dates without the slash, obviously. So it's like, so it would be December 31st as one date. And then it would be January 1st. So this is a one as the second date. And then the next day would be January 2nd. And then it would be January 3rd. And then, of course, it would be January 4th afterwards. 
and the zero is because it would be December 30th before, so it's a one. I'm I'm really sad that I spent so much time on that. <laughs> I'm really sad because How does this sound? I can't even imagine somebody looking at that and being like, oh yeah, that's Ladies like a calendar the day. without spending so much time on, I don't know, I guess my opinion, more meaningful logic based answers. <laughs> um, wow, that that felt like a waste of time, honestly. Um, yeah, not feeling very super, super hot about that one. Now it seems to be that type of puzzle in general. It's just not, I don't know if it's just me. I guess I'm curious to see if you guys have similar thoughts about it. But despite all the time we sank on that, I, uh, I do not want to end on it. So let's give another one a go and hopefully enjoy it a bit more. Rolling the die, 80 Picarats. A young boy sits quietly on a stoop, rolling a single die over and over. Each time the die stops rolling, he picks it up, examines it, and whispers something to himself. Each time he rolls a 1, he whispers 15. Each time he gets a 6, he whispers 20. The boy just rolled a 3. What number will he whisper this time? So 1 is 15. And then the 6 is 20. What if he gets a three? Each time he rolls those numbers, he does this. So it's got to be based on that specific number. It's not like he's counting something where the num where the number of times you know he rolls that is obviously changing. Hmm. Each time he rolls a 1, he roll, he whispers 15, and each time it's a 6, a 20. So, like, the, I guess the obvious thing is to try to interpolate, right? So, like, if you map 1 to 15 and 6 to 20, then 2 would be 16, then 3 would be 17, 4 would be 18, 5 would be 19, and 6 would be 20. So, I feel like that's, like, kind of the straightforward answer. 3 would be a 17. But at the same time... I don't know, that doesn't, that seems a little bit too straightforward for like an 80 pick rat puzzle. So I don't know. I guess like, if you roll a 1 and then you sum all of the other numbers, I think you get 15. Is that the case? 2 and 3 is 5 and 4 is 9. And then 5 would be 13, no, they would, <laughs> that is not 15, um, that would be 19, I believe. No, it would be 20, right? The sum from, from 1 to 6 is, uh, is 21, so if you just subtract the 1, it'll be 20. And if you rolled a 6, that would be 15. If you were to take away the 6, that is. Which is interesting. Hmm. Is there a relationship there? <laughs> if you roll a 1, you, you subtract 6 from the 21 total. And if you roll a 6, you subtract 1 from the 20 total. So if you roll a 3, you would maybe subtract 4 from the total. Even then, you would get 17. I'm tempted to try it. I mean, I think that's... I think that's a pretty reasonable... inference. <laughs> I don't know if it's what they... what they want. I feel like something that's gonna be relevant is that he examines it each time. So each time the die stops rolling, he picks it up, examines it, and whispers something to himself. Is that meaningful? Is he looking for something? Does he have to add something up on all the other faces of the die when he picks it up? Or am I reading into it too much? I'm trying to think, what? how are the faces of a die arranged? Is the one across from the six? Because I'm thinking it's like, oh, maybe you subtract the face across, <laughs> like diametrically across, on the opposite side of the, of the die from the total, 21. Because if that would be the case, 
then three would actually be, I think, diametrically across from five. Which would give 16 instead of 17. I'm probably jumping the gun, but I think 17 is a reasonable first answer. So let's let's give that a go. Um, if 17 is the correct answer, like the triangle problem, I'll be excited. Because I, I love the number I 17. It. I'm not, admittedly, 100%. Oh, wow. Professor, I've solved it! Alright. I guess we solved it. Um... That was it. Wow. The boy is counting the number of dots currently visible on the die. The only face of the die not included in this count, in this count is the one that faces down. The top and bottom sides of a die always add up to seven, so it's easy to calculate the total for the five faces exposed on any given roll. Wow, that was... Now that, that seems like a relatively obtuse thing. Interesting. I didn't know that about die, or like dice in general, that the top and bottom sides always add up to seven. Um, from the way they had it pictured, I thought that the, the four would be next to the three, not opposite the three. But, huh, interesting. I also don't feel super, super great about that one, admittedly, but excellent work, my boy. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna try red and blue number two. I think this was one of the later ones. I remember getting, it was like in the top, like, hundred or something, or like after a hundred, and it was like red and blue one, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Give it a go, Luke. Um, yeah, it was like one of the later puzzles, and I was like, huh? Why are we getting a red and blue one this late in the game? Okay. Oh, so basically now they've added the letters. Two sets of color balls labeled A through D sit in the box as shown below. Your job is to move the red balls to the red zone and the blue balls to the blue zone. Sound difficult? It gets harder. <laughs> Within each zone, all the balls must stay in their correct ABCD order in order for you to complete the puzzle. Balls can only move into vacant spots and they can't jump over other balls. Okay. So what we had done before was, um, was utilize this center space like this so that we could bring one over to the other side and then there would still be one free square that we could slide something into. So, for example, if I wanted to take this C all the way over here, for now, um, I could. And then what I could do is uh, I could bring D over, or B for that matter, um, but I could bring D over like this. And then I could slip C, is that what I want to do right now? C, like down here. And then, yeah, that is what I want to do for now. We'll move D over this way. And then, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, I have to, I have to get reacquainted uh, here. Um, so then I could bring something like D over here and bring C back, and then if I were to like bring D up like that, I can bring the red one over that way and do that. So with that, we've kind of, we've maneuvered at least one of the, or each of them is now on the correct side, one of them is actually in the correct placement. Uh, now we're gonna wanna bring the red B over, I believe. And then we're gonna to wanna to bring the blue C, I think. So how are we gonna to want to do this? Oh, I should have just, um, well, I could click restart for the sake of moves, but I'm actually just gonna undo that move that I just did. We'll move the D back up there, and then we can move the, uh, the blue C all the way over, and then the blue B like so, we can slide the red C up so that we can slide the red D down and then the red C back into spot, into, into place. And now, what do we want to do? Now, I probably shouldn't have slid that back into space. Hmm. 
Yeah, because I'm going to have a tough time getting that blue A out now. Right? Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, I can rearrange them so long as I have this space in the middle. It won't be optimal in terms of moves, but it's definitely doable at that point. Although, rearranging the A at the top is going to be the toughest, actually. That may be the one that I need to get rid of first, actually. Or at least try to as early as possible, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Something else I could do is I could actually... Oh, I realized I, I probably did not need to restart there, but um, that's okay. That is okay. We'll do that for now. And again, yeah, we'll, we'll pretty much start off the same way. Okay. But yeah, by, by basically emptying out all of the the balls in a column into that middle space, I can rearrange one of them, um, or a couple of them, within the same column. And I think that will be helpful. So now the question is, let's, let's get the red C on the correct side. So let's do that for now. And then we'll take the red... Oh no, now we'll do a, the exchange for the sake of ordering. Yeah. And then... What? I need to make the blue B available, I believe. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is put that back, and then take this red C out temporarily, so we can move the blue B out. And then we can put the red C back. We'll put it up here for now. So we have that space to work with. Um, because I'm going to need to put this blue B there. Hmm. And then take the blue C all the way across. And then this red B all the way over here. So I can put the blue B up like that. Or do I want to take that chance, or that moment, to swap the the A and the D? I think I do. Although, no, I won't. Yeah, I don't think I will just yet. I'll put the blue B there for now. And then we'll take the red B and go up there, and then the blue C can go all the way back over here. And now, we will um, be close, but not quite there. As you can see, we'll put the red B back. And now, we're almost there. We just need to get the A's across. And the A's will probably prove to be the most difficult. Oh, I should have I switched them while I could have. So what we'll do is we'll do this first. And then we'll bring that up. And then this over like that. And then, yeah, we can switch these like so. Although... Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have switched the B and the D. I should have had the, 
the blue D go all the way to the right, and then have the blue B all the way up there. Yeah, well I can do that. Can I still do that? Or would I have to rearrange the C and everything? I would. So for now, I think we'll we'll live with it. But um, that was not ideal. <laughs> so, so we'll do that and see, I guess, if this concept works in the first place. Then we can move the blue B back over there. And then, what? Then... I can take the red A out like this, the blue C can go back, we'll scoot it down for the sake of having that flexibility, then we'll scoot that A up there, and now we'll probably need to do a similar, I guess, procedure on this side. Um, again, I'm keeping the B and D the same way I did on the other side, just so I don't confuse myself, but for the time being, we'll do this. And then we can scoot the B back up. <laughs> yeah, this is, what's funny is this is totally going to do it, but it's going to be, the, the D's and the A's are going to be switched. Yeah, so... So now what? Um... Let's rearrange these. And how can I do that? So whichever one I take out to the right, I can rearrange it with um, the, the bottom one. That bottom one is the one that I can really interact with the most. So, for example, if I want the A to go up there, I'll need to switch this with the C so that I can do that and then shift this out of the way. And then I can bring that all the way up there <clears throat> and then we can file in accordingly. Now, this obviously we're kind of inventing things on the fly and I've had some, I've undone some of my movements, so this is not going to be a very efficient uh, solution to the move, to the puzzle, but it should get the job done. So, let's see, how do I want to do this? Um, we can put, we'll put C here, and then B will go up here, D can come this way, A can slide all the way up, there we go. Alright, and we have done it in 61 moves. Whew. I like that one. Um, Legends Apprentice saves the day. I mean, you guys probably already have a feel for it based on just the the block sliding puzzles and and this one. I kind of like. Well, yeah, I guess I like these ones. <laughs> Great job is all it says. I knew you could do it. All right. So now we have completed the decorator's house. And with that, we now just have the art lover's house and the golden apple's house left. The Puzzle Master's house, do you have to like do a perfect run to unlock that? Or is it after like 4,500 Picarats or whatever it may be? Um, or is it really just as simple as unlocking, you know, or beating all the other houses? I feel like that's going to be what it is. Um, I think that would be the most sensible too, anyways. But yeah, um, I guess I'm not a big fan of the pattern puzzles <laughs> from what I've seen, at least of these challenge ones. Uh, yeah, not not exactly my favorite, but but some of them have been pretty cool. So um, I'm glad that they included these for sure uh, for those that are looking to spend a little bit more time actually, you know, thinking about some stuff that's really going to get them to, you know, scratch their brain. And even if you're not getting the right answer, you're at least, you know, exercising your brain and thinking about things from a different perspective. But anyways, um, until the next episode when we take on the art lover's house, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.